Hello, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon for a town hall on the COVID-19 vaccines. I'm Sean Turner, Professor of Strategic Communication at Michigan State University, and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. This is the second in a series of town halls for the Michigan State University community to address questions about the COVID-19 vaccines. Today, we're gonna to cover everything from when and where you can get vac vaccinated to which safety measures you should continue to take after receiving the vaccine. For the next hour, we'll be joined by three expert guests from MSU, Ingham County, and Sparrow Hospital. They'll discuss the status of COVID-19 cases in the community and where we are in the vaccination process. They'll also discuss the safety and efficacy of the recently approved Johnson & Johnson vaccine and future plans for vaccine distribution. Of course, we'll also spend some time this afternoon answering questions and addressing your concerns about the vaccines to help you make fully informed decisions. Now, it's important that we point out that while our guests, while extremely knowledgeable, they are not here to give personal medical advice. If you need medical advice, please contact and consult with your personal care physician. And now I'm pleased to be joined today by our three guests who have wide ranging experience in community health, hospital administration, and academic medicine leadership. We're gonna start our conversation today with Dr. Norm Beauchamp. Dr. Beauchamp's background as a healthcare leader overseeing MSU's medical, academic, and service apparatus has really helped the university navigate through this public health crisis. He'll be followed by Ingham County Health Officer, Linda Vale, and Sparrow Hospital Medical Chief of Staff Elect, Dr. Lakia Tucker. With that, it is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Norm Beauchamp. Dr. Beauchamp, thank you for joining us today. I'm gonna to go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I really appreciate it. Thank you for moderating today. I appreciate everyone uh, that is in attendance. I just wanna begin by thanking the MSU community and all those listening. It's been over a year and your perseverance, your resilience, your patience, uh, your commitment has helped us get through what has been an incredibly challenging year. And we believe that there is light uh, shining in the other end of this tunnel. And we feel fortunate to be able to share some of this with you today. If it's all right, Sean, I'd like to uh, share screen and take individuals through some of the things I've put together. COVID-19 remains a threat. Michigan is expanding access to the vaccine to help end the pandemic. And the health of our community depends on individuals making informed decisions. And that's a big part of why we're meeting together today to help share information and make sure that if there are questions, we can help address them. So where are we? In front of you is a graph of the number of coronavirus cases across the United States since March of 2020. And what you can see is peaks and valleys with, with a large peak uh, towards the end of January 2021 in new cases. And then what started to be a pretty significant drop off uh, coming into late March, with over the last 14 days, about a 7% drop. Unfortunately, over the last week, we're starting to see coronavirus come back up in 27 states uh, with about a 1% increase in the number of coronavirus cases. If you look at some of the counties uh, that are located in Michigan, you can see that trend. This is Kent County, the arrow going up, the arrow going up, and the arrow is going up. And part of that is, is related to emergence of the new variant of the virus. It's also been a relaxing of some of the restrictions, as well as people are just tired um, of really, you know, adhering to some of the, the things that keep us safe. And, and some of this weariness is manifested in some laxening of their ability to adhere to those best practices. Acceptance of the vaccine is going to be a key strategy. Uh, this is just a graph of the number of individuals across the country that have received the vaccine. 
Um, we're giving the vaccine nationally at about two and a half million vaccines a day. And it's estimated that up to 120 million people have now received the vaccine. And we're really enthusiastic about the pace at which uh, this vaccine is being delivered. And we really want to stress to everyone listening today that this is what we've been waiting for. This is how we shall save lives, our own and everyone around us. And vaccines will be how we return to campus in the fall and home life, more like the times pre-COVID. It's a key part of the strategy as well as all of the things that we have been doing um, in terms of limiting the spread of disease like social distancing, hand washing and mask wearing. All three vaccines, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer and Moderna completely prevented hospitalizations and deaths in clinical trials. The vaccines differ in a number of details of how they work and how they were studied. And it's led to some questions and some confusion. And as Sean talked about, I'll clarify a little bit related to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I'd mention two things about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, the first is that uh, in terms of preventing the disease, it seems to be about 66% effective, but really important is that it's completely prevented hospitalizations and deaths in clinical trials. And that's been the case for each of the three vaccines. And you'll hear more about that from the other speakers. The difference in the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine versus the Johnson & Johnson vaccine can be largely characterized on this slide. Here is what you've heard people talk about called mRNA, which is messenger RNA. And the way that the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine works is it's put in a lipid droplet and it's injected. It's injected into the muscle, it's uptaken, and it makes the protein that you want to detect that is called a spike protein. Once that's manifest, the body will develop antibodies. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine incorporates DNA into what is a virus that causes the common cold, but it's denatured in a way that it won't cause a cold, but it allows this DNA to get uptaken into muscle cells. And here's a picture, a cartoon of that. Here's the virus attaching to a muscle cell and it gets brought into the cell. And then what happens is it starts to manifest with these surface spike proteins which triggers the formation of antibodies so that when an individual is, is exposed to the virus itself, the Corona-19 virus, these antibodies will help fight that infection. So the difference in these two vaccines is really the vehicle with which you take up the genetic material and whether it's RNA or it's, it's DNA but they're both highly effective. And you have heard it said by Linda Vale and others, the best vaccine is the vaccine that you can get access to. So any one of these vaccines are really important. What's happening at Michigan State in terms of getting vaccines to our campus? Well, first and foremost, please take opportunity to sign up for vaccinations in all of the venues where it's possible. Right, whether that's your healthcare provider or that's through Meyer. But we also on campus are following two paths. The first is a part of an emergency plan that really has been worked on for 10 years. And in that plan, uh, MSU leaders have made requests to the state to receive safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines. And as a part of our emergency preparedness, we have the systems and structures in place to be a local distribution for public health emergency centers. Our current distribution plan has the capacity to give vaccinations up to 2,000 individuals a day. And we'll be able to move forward with that um, within 48 hours of receiving the vaccines. We also through MSU Healthcare have developed the ability to also administer vaccines. And we're working closely with Ingham County Health Department in our state. And we have applied to be approved uh, to receive vaccines. And we received that approval in January, 2021. And again, we're awaiting our shipment of vaccines 
with the hope that when they arrive, we'll be able to help administer them to the community. Through this mechanism, we'll be able to administer vaccines to individuals that are 16 years or older. Uh, when we receive the vaccines, we'll send a message out to the community through internal and external um, communication channels. And we'll also put signage up on campus. And through this, we'll be able to, at the start, administer 400 vaccines a day. When will we be vaccinating? Well, once we get the shipment at MSU, we will be doing this, but the community is also incredibly engaged and, and Linda Vale will speak more of that. March 22nd, persons 50 and up and persons with disabilities or chronic diseases can receive the vaccine. And April 5th, everyone 16 and up will be eligible for vaccination. Who will be doing the vaccinations as it relates to the work on campus? We'll have MSU faculty um, and their families have volunteered, um, staff, retiree students and healthcare patients. We've received a thousand individuals who are willing to help uh, participate uh, in this effort. So with that, Sean, I'll stop my part of the introduction um, and turn it back to you. Thanks, Dr. Boschamp. That was a great uh, explanation of how the virus works and what we're expecting here at MSU. I wonder if you can talk for a minute. Uh, you mentioned that we may be getting those, uh, those doses of vaccine on campus soon. Uh, two, two points. Uh, one, is it the case that when we have those for faculty, staff, uh, and, and students here, will there be a sort of prioritization of, uh, of who gets vaccine, vaccinated when? And uh, also, just with regard to uh, getting those vaccines on on campus, uh, will it be sort of a, a first come first serve, or or uh, you know that anybody will be able to get the vaccine? Yeah, thank you. What we feel is really important, Sean, is to follow what our uh, partner Linda Vale is really putting forward. And so, if we use the exact same protocols that Ingham County is in the state, it will it'll avoid confusion. So we'll have a mechanism to sign up. There'll be the same prioritization. Uh, that's being used. Currently, we are one of the sites that we are doing vaccinations at the pavilion in partnership. And so again, we will just line up with exactly how it's being done in the same approach to prioritization. Got it. Thanks, Dr. Boschamp. That's a great lead, lead into our next guest. Uh, I want to turn to Ingham County Health Officer, Linda Vale. Uh, Linda is going to shed some light on local distribution efforts in Ingham County and give us the latest on eligibility groups for the vaccine, among other things. Linda, again, thank you for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sean, and uh, thank you, Dr. Beauchamp. I sat there listening to Dr. Beauchamp's nice, calm voice, and it, it reminded me of the early days of the pandemic, wandering through Meyer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hearing, hearing the audio of Dr. Beauchamp and his uh, very informative um, uh, educational stuff that they put over the Meyer PA system about, about COVID. I don't know if you all know that that was him, but that was Dr. Beauchamp all through Meyer stores for months. So, um, so vaccine distribution in Ingham County is happening largely at the MSU Pavilion where we vaccinate um, this week probably about 1500 a day. Um, we probably can push that up to close to 2,000 a day. Um, largely at the MSU Pavilion, that is Pfizer vaccine. That is the first vaccine that we received um, and is still the primary vaccine that we receive. Uh, we do, in addition to having our um, most significant mass vaccination operation at the MSU Pavilion, we have um, uh, an operation at the Dwight Rich School we also um, do Saturday clinics at the Ingham County Fairgrounds in a similar type of drive-through fashion, although a little, bit, a little bit smaller. And we're only there, I think we're there from 10 to one. And we also have spent a lot of time in this community um, doing pop-up clinics, community-based clinics, cl clinics at churches, clinics at community centers, getting to senior housing complexes and having clinics there, and then vaccinating the homebound that are there while we are there. Um, we have vaccinated the homeless and then continue to vaccinate the homeless as well as shelter workers. Uh, the last uh, eligibility also included inmates. So we do operate the jail medical operation for Ingham County. So have offered vaccination to inmates as well. Um, as of today, 50 and over are eligible for vaccine. 
um, regardless of any underlying condition. 16 and over are eligible for vaccination if they have um, one of the high risk underlying health conditions um, that put them at high risk for severe cases of COVID. So um, really as of April 5th, it's gonna get real simple in that everybody's eligible for a vaccine. So trying to stay lined up with prioritization is gonna get real, real easy, real fast. Um, in fact, um, in reality, in the state of Michigan, unfortunately, um, we do tend to be a state that is on the, uh, on the side of one of the top ranked states in obesity, as well as diabetes, as well as some other things. So we will have a significant population of people who will be eligible even now with the underlying conditions. As a matter of fact, I had heard when the 50 plus became eligible that about 80% of our 50 plus population have chronic underlying conditions. So it is obviously uh, you know, a massive effort to coordinate all of that. Um, we get out significant amounts of vaccine every week. Um, we have volunteers that are there with us. We have partners that have helped us. Um, MSU um, uh, emergency management facilities and MSU police have been um, just amazing partners and uh, you know, much of what's been able to happen out there without the, the wraparound support that happens from Michigan State University would not be as possible as it is. So we certainly appreciate that from MSU as we continue down this path of vaccinating. We still have really unreliable amounts of vaccine that are being allocated, which is why you haven't seen vaccine allocated to any place other than the two major hospitals and health departments. And that is true all across this state other than the pharmacy programs. So those pharmacy programs are a federal pharmacy partnership program. So the fact that Meyer and Rite Aid have vaccine is because the federal government directly allocated vaccine to them as part of a federal pharmacy partnership program. That was modeled after a partnership program that existed early on to make sure that we got our long-term care facility staff as well as residents vaccinated. At this point in time, as of last week anyway, we have vaccinated at least one dose, 76% of our 65 and older population who reside in Ingham County. We have vaccinated approximately 38% of the 70%. So we're, we're aiming for that 70% um, of our total population that are eligible to be vaccinated. So when we get to 70%, of course we want to get to 100, but that's our 16 and over population. I believe that's about 240,000 people. So when you take 70% 70, 70 of that, we are about 38% or almost halfway to having vaccinated that 70% of our 16 and over population. Um, so obviously, you know, I, I believe that we will see that bar move. I think the 70% bar was set a little bit low to keep us all from being a little overwhelmed. Um, but I do think that um, scientifically and as a medical community and as we look at trials and that sort of thing uh, and we look at the virus and especially with more transmissible variants, I think we're really thinking that we need to get closer to 75, 80% of our population vaccinated. Um, but we're gonna move that bar up a little bit at a time. We do see a lot of movement in terms of the willingness to get vaccinated. So as time has gone on, you've seen increases in percents of people who say, yes, I will get vaccinated. So that is also a positive turn of events. Uh, that's, that's really great information, Linda. A couple of questions for you. You, you mentioned, I think if I understood correctly, 38% of, of 16 and older. You know, there's a lot of discussion right now about the sort of race between getting people vaccinated and avoiding another uh, spike in uh, coronavirus cases. Can you talk for a minute about how your assessment of how we're doing here in Ingham County with regard to that that uh, that race between the two? Are we in a good place, or uh, is there is there more work that needs to be done there? Well, first of all, I'm going to correct back to it's 38 percent of the 70 percent. So the goal is 78 percent. We've got 38 percent of that 70 percent, which I'd, I'd have to do some math. So whatever that 70 percent of 241,000 is, we're 38 percent of the way there. Um, in terms of, you know, actually I, I had a conversation with my good friend, Dr. Renee Kennedy over the weekend about the fact that efficiency is, is really at odds with equity. 
Um, when, it, when we talk about needing to get vaccine out to our particularly vulnerable populations, to our populations of color who might be um, hesitant, to people who have significant barriers to healthcare and healthcare access and those sorts of things, that is a much slower process to do that and to do it right. And at the same time, we have these metrics to meet around getting 90% of our vaccine out first doses within seven days of when we receive it and things like that. So needing to do that quickly um, does compromise to some extent that equity. Those two things just really don't align with each other. Doing it fastest is about the people that show up first and then can show up the easiest, right? They've got the time in their days, in their work life to you know, find those vaccines and get to the places where they are. Um, so that is a fine balance that we are always trying to strike. And it takes a lot of manpower to not only do the efficiency, but to make sure that we don't leave that equity piece aside. So um, it definitely is a challenge. We're doing quite well. I mean, when we, when we can tell you that we have, and it will be more this week, every week, a few more of our 65 plus population come in um, with 76% of them vaccinated. That's a, really, that's a really good number. Keep in mind, we just opened to 50 and over um, two weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, it was March 8th. So it hasn't been very long that we started vaccinating anybody under the age of 65, unless it was related to occupation. So I would say that we are doing quite well. That's, that's really encouraging. Uh, thank you for that. And I think it's a great lead into our third guest today. Uh, our third guest is Sparrow Hospital Medical Chief of Staff Elect, Dr. Lakia Tucker. Uh, Dr. Tucker is gonna talk a little bit about local distribution plans at Sparrow's mass vaccination clinic at the old, at the old Sears drive-thru. Uh, she'll also address some of your questions about the Johnson & Johnson, Johnson vaccine. So with that, uh, Dr. Tucker, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much to you, Sean, for moderating and thank you for um, MSU for having me and for asking for, for Sparrow to represent at this uh, talk today. I'm humbled and honored to present today. You can go to the next slide. So at Sparrow, we're celebrating 125 years of service to the community and we pride ourselves on keeping the patient at the center of our care. So you can see that with our pyramid here. Sparrow is amongst the top 150 hospitals in Newsweek's national rankings. We ranked 144th, the fifth highest ranking of all hospitals in Michigan, and we were the only mid-Michigan facility named, and we value the community and our community partners. So thank you to all of you. Next. Next slide. Currently, there's three vaccines that are FDA approved for use, and um, Dr. Bochamp uh, so graciously um, highlighted all of these, the Pfizer, Moderna, and the Janssen and Janssen. Um, all of these vaccines are safe and effective. So the Pfizer is a two dose regimen, 21 days apart, the Moderna 28 days apart, and the Johnson and Johnson is a monovalent that is a single dose regimen and it is preservative free. So there's an advantage there. The best a vaccine to get is the one that you can get a hold of. So please get the vaccine when your turn arises. And as Linda has alluded to, most of the uh, people can get a vaccine here very soon. All of these all of these vaccines are safe and effective. Large clinical trials comprised of diverse individuals were tested for all three of the vaccines. And it has been shown that generally benefits of receiving the vaccine outweigh the risks of becoming infected with the coronavirus disease. All of the vaccines are safe with pregnancy and with breastfeeding. The vaccines are shown to produce antibodies. And when you think about antibodies, antibodies are the things that can afford protection to the unborn fetus. And we have to think about antibodies producing being produced and also causing protection for um, not only just the unborn fetus, but also when a patient is breastfeeding or lactation, then we wanna think about that. So there's some extra benefit there and it does not cause any infertility at all. So a little background on Sparrow's vaccine efforts. As of March 8th, Sparrow has given 55,488 vaccines. 
and we're partnering with the Ingham County Health Department to vaccinate essential employee groups. The Sparrow Frandor vaccination point of distribution can give approximately 1,000 vaccines per day, and this is a drive through clinic site. Additionally, Sparrow's affiliate hospitals are working with each of their local hospital health departments, I'm sorry, local health departments to distribute vaccines in their communities. And plans are underway to open a megapod inside the Sears retail space. And this is a location where a more substantial number of individuals can be vaccinated. And we've been using all of the vaccines that are available to us, including Pfizer, Moderna, and now Johnson & Johnson. So when it comes down to scheduling, how do we get notified? So each Friday, the state advises us of how many doses of vaccine we will receive for the following week. We then make decisions about how many appointments we can handle each day, and we post these appointments on MySparrow so that patients can schedule. As of today, all patients 50 and over and those 16 and over who have a qualifying medical condition are eligible to schedule. And as Linda said, on April 5th, pretty much everybody is going to be able to get vaccinated. So all patients 16 and older are eligible. All patients can schedule an appointment on the MySparrow portal. And patients who do not have a computer or do not are not computer savvy, may call our Registration Assistance Center for help with scheduling at 877-205-1300 if they need help. One thing to remember is that patients who are 16 and 17 can only receive the Pfizer vaccine and they must be accompanied by a parent or guardian and that 16 and 17 year olds can only schedule appointments for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And this is to ensure that we have the Pfizer vaccine available for them. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Uh, that's great information that uh, folks can certainly use to be able to know when and where to get vaccines. Uh, let me uh, ask you a follow-up question here. Sure. Um, do, do we have any sense of how long the vaccine will last once it's been administered to a patient? Sure. Um, at this point, um, we don't have an exact um, idea, but you know, I was from the research that I've been able to look into. It seems that you know there may be a, a need for for revaccination in a year or so, but I don't know if Linda can pipe in on that, or or if Norm, if Dr. Bochamp can pipe in on that, but from the research that I've seen, it seems like maybe a year, maybe we'll have to do a booster. Yeah, I know it's, it's yeah. early one, so, so we're still figuring it out. Uh, Linda, did you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, the first people that were vaccinated in clinical trials are not even a year out from having been vaccinated. So we really don't have anything that clearly tells us the answer to that yet. So most of that is, is basically some sorts of projection where we do anticipate that this, this is very likely not to be a, you know, like your shingles vaccine, you get it once you're done, or some of the other vaccines, there may be two doses, you get them and you're done. Um, some early studies of SARS-CoV, not SARS-CoV-2, which has a lot of similarities to SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID-19, did show that the immunity lasted for three to five years in some cases. So it could be that it's an every three-year vaccine. The bottom line is we just don't really know yet. I think what you will be seeing is those folks that were in those early clinical trials will be followed to find out when that immunity starts waning. And so all the rest of us will know long before because they were vaccinated, I believe spring, late spring, early summer was when the first Pfizer clinical trials started. So we do have some people who were vaccinated that long ago. Sure, I understand that. That's great. You know, we've got a lot of questions along those lines. People are really interested in the specifics of the vaccines. Uh, 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 Norm, uh, let me let me go to you, Norm Bushamp, uh, and ask. You know, are you are you aware of concerns with the AstraZeneca vaccine causing blood clots in specific patient populations? Uh, and if if, if so, are, are people allowed to request a specific vaccine? 
So the, there were some early reported concerns related to blood clotting and the AstraZeneca uh, vaccination. But there was a report that just came out from the World Health Organization that said that that wasn't of concern. There's also, uh, as a part of the study, uh, a group referred to as the Data Monitoring Board um, that also uh, demonstrated there was no increased risk of, of blood clotting with the AstraZeneca virus uh, vaccination. Uh, and it, it, it's felt to be safe uh, and accessible and approved. And I turn to my colleagues if they have anything to, to add to that. Um, moreover, uh, in terms of requesting a specific uh, a vaccination, and maybe again, uh, Linda or uh, like you coming to that, but my understanding is is the probably the best approach would be to go to a location that was offering uh, that vaccination. But Linda, you know more about the distribution of vaccines than I do, uh, or Dr. Tucker. So right now, vaccine is still fairly scarce, mm -hmm. um, and honestly, allocations are unpredictable. Like this week, we got Pfizer vaccine. I got no J&J &J vaccine. I got no Moderna vaccine. So clearly I cannot meet a request for a specific vaccine when I only got one of the vaccines. So we do recommend that people take the first vaccine that is available to them at the time that they can get an appointment for that vaccine. Um, there was a single application of Johnson & Johnson vaccine when it was first um, authorized under the emergency use authorization. I think they shipped it out right after that. Um, and we have not received any more since. So that is the only Johnson & Johnson allocation that we have received. Um, it goes back and forth with Moderna and how much we have on, on hand with that. So it, until we have a more um, reliable supply of all three of them, it really is fairly impossible for us to tell you that yes, we can sign you up for a specific vaccine. Uh, so that's that's kind of where we are right now. Right, you just know you're getting in line for a vaccine, but you don't know what you're getting in line for. But once you get the vaccine, you're coming back for the same, if you have to get a two dose, you're getting the same vaccine that you would have gotten before. And, and, and Dr. Tucker, that's, that's a good point. Let me, if I can stick with you, uh, first on uh, the comment you just made, in terms of the amount of time between vaccines, uh, you know, there's been, uh, there've been some people who've been on national news saying, you know, they've got, they, they're just getting one and they're going to uh, not get that second shot because they feel like getting one is enough to allow more vaccine to go around. Uh, what's your take on that? I mean, if you, if you are getting the two dose, should people go get and get the two dose and should they do it within that two week period as a, as a, as a rule? They absolutely should go ahead and get complete the series of vaccine um, in order to have it be the most efficacious. They definitely should complete it. Um, it is going to be somewhat effective. I mean, you're going to get, you know, somewhere around 50 or, you know, 60 or maybe a little bit more um, uh, percent of efficacy with just the one if it's a if they get just half of the dose but you know the thing is they don't if you start it you may as well finish it so that you can get the most benefit from it um you don't want to you know if you're yeah, going to do it you may as well do it unless there's some reason that you have that's serious that you shouldn't yeah I, well, there's I, actually an there's an immunology reason for it too because that first vaccine is going to produce some antibodies it's the second one that really gets into like the memory part of immunity which is your t cells and your b cells so you don't you don't have the dose of vaccine that really gets into those gets you know those memory cells which then have the memory of it and then they crank out the antibodies if they see that virus again. So that is part of the reason why that second dose is really important. Yeah, thank, that. thank you, that's good perspective. Uh, Dr. Tucker, what, what, I'd like to go back to you on this question as well. And, and Linda, you may weigh, weigh in as well on this one. Uh, you, Dr. Tucker, you mentioned that all the vaccines are safe for, uh, for pregnant women, I, I believe. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, why uh, 16 is the magic number for one vaccine? and? Uh, when or why we, we, we're not seeing you know, 12 to 15 year olds uh, eligible to be vaccinated? Right, so it's a matter of where uh, the, the subjects that the clinical trials were tested, you know, they were tested in that age group. So they weren't tested in the patients that were younger than that. So we can 
you know, you can extrapolate some data backwards if you want to, but we don't necessarily have that data to go on. So if we have 16 year olds and up, we can use the vaccine in that age group. And we can certainly use it in pregnancy because we know that these vaccines are safe in, um, in this population. Um, and we're going to produce the antibodies in the, in the patients. Um, we wouldn't use it in children because the children haven't been tested. I think that was an expediency issue. Um, when you're talking about trying to produce a lot of vaccine in a very short period of time, and we know this was done in fairly record time, um, your, your clinical trials get fairly narrow in order to get the vaccine out to the most people the quickest. And that's why you don't see that full range of trials. That's why you don't see the full range of trials in dosing schedules. Can we give it every three weeks or can it be in two months? There was just not enough time to do all those different nuances and variations. We needed to get a single vaccine in place that we would, knew would work a certain way. And now we have to follow the clinical guidelines for it. And, and Linda, do you, do you have to live in Ingham County to be able to get the, uh, the vaccine in Ingham County? That is the way, yes. Well, at, at, at our institution, yes. At Sparrow Health System, clearly their patients span quite, quite a footprint. Um, so Sparrow would be vaccinating you know, across their footprint. Um, I get allocated vaccine based on population in my county, which pretty much says that, that I need to use it for the population in my county. Otherwise, I'm not covering my population adequately. I will say that the new Ford Field Regional Hub that's opened up as of, I believe today, that we'll be doing 6,000 vaccinations a day is available to anybody in the state. And, and I tried that little system over the weekend and registered myself real quick and got a email reply saying that I could schedule an appointment within a couple of days, recommended that to a friend who found the same thing. So that Ford Field option is out there for people as well. Okay. And I just want to uh, clarify, uh, Linda, and what if you uh, don't live in Ingham County, but you work in Ingham County? If you work in Ingham County, um, then you can also be vaccinated in Ingham County based on, based on the priority employment groups. So we didn't go down to all of the different essential personnel. There are certain essential personnel that were prioritized, and then we just kind of jumped by age groups. So um, it really depends on where we are as a health department with saying, we're going to prioritize some other essential personnel, then it's a matter of whether you work in Ingham County. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, Dr. Tucker, if you can just take a, a minute to uh, talk about uh, Sparrow and uh, where you need to live or work to be able to get vaccinated at Sparrow. Absolutely. So if you live or work in Ingham County and there's the surrounding counties, you saw a map when I um, what was my slides, you could see the affiliate where the affiliate hospitals are, which is a pretty wide range. So, you know, most people can get vaccinated at Sparrow. If you pull up the My Sparrow app um, or My Sparrow Portal app, um, you can find out exactly if you qualify. And also, if you call the assistance number, that is a good way to be able to find out if you qualify. But pretty much almost anybody can qualify to come through. Thanks, Dr. Tucker. Uh, Dr. Beauchamp, uh, can you talk about uh, what it might look like with regard to uh, safety precautions and procedures on campus as people, as we look to come back in the fall? And, and more specifically, I'm looking at whether or not there is a, uh, a threshold at which some of the uh, procedures will change in the fall based on how many people have been vaccinated. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sean. That's a really important question. Um, we do, we do uh, envision that we'll be able to relax some of the restrictions uh, as, as we expect to have largely the majority of students vaccinated by the fall. Um, we, we still will want to you know, be thoughtful about things like social distancing, uh, hand washing, because as, as Linda and Dr. Tucker talked about, we don't yet know the degree of protection the, the vaccination confers and would like to do our best to minimize uh, the spread. But we actually believe that, you know, coming back in the fall will be much more like life was uh, pre-COVID. And there'll be some people that, you know, may, may not be able to get 
the, the vaccine prior to coming back. And in those instances, we would ask those individuals to adhere to, you know, many of the rules that are in place right now. Great. Uh, thanks for that, Norm. Uh, uh, Norm, I, I think you can answer this one, and maybe Dr. Tucker can, can weigh in as well. But uh, what about uh, people who have previously uh, had COVID or, or had the antibodies? Uh, how should they be thinking about getting vaccinated? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, because one might think if you've had COVID-19, well, then you're, you're protected, and you don't need to get the vaccine. But but the approach that's, that's, that's best accepted because we don't know how much protection is conferred and for how long, if you've had COVID-19, the disease, that we are still asking people to get the vaccination. Well stated, exactly. Um, you, the people who've been effect, infected with COVID have at very likely 90 days worth of of antibodies, but and possibly longer, but we can't assume that they can get reinfected with the virus in between that time frame, even um, before that 90 days is up. Um, so we certainly do make sure that we uh, push, for, you know, encourage them to get vaccinated um, after they're out of their quarantine period. Um, we certainly want to make sure that they're out of that. Um, but um, we certainly uh, allocate, you know, <laughs> certainly advocate for that. So well stated. That's very, very good point. Uh, we do have a question and we touched on this a little earlier. Um, there are some people who have uh, allergies and may want to request a, a specific vaccine because of, uh, of allergies. I, I know all, all of these uh, vaccines are a little different. Uh, do we uh, know whether or not uh, if someone needs to, to request the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, do we know whether or not that's something that, uh, at least at Sparrow, that they can uh, do, Dr. Tucker? So um, they, as far as the teenagers, you know, they get the Pfizer for sure on the Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Otherwise, there isn't a specific, you know, they can't specifically say that they want to get a certain one because of, you know, a certain allocation. And really, as far as allergies go, there really isn't a strong allergic reaction at all to any of these vaccines. So um, the answer to that would be a no. <laughs> okay, understand. Uh, uh, Linda, I'd like to, to go back to you, uh, if we can. Um, when, when we think about... Uh, sort of what's happening here in Ingham County uh, in comparison to the rest of the state. Um, are, are there things here in Ingham County that we're looking at doing differently as we get to a point where vaccine is not scarce? You know, we've got uh, questions about whether or not we're going to uh, move forward and open it up to everyone or that's if that's going to be a state decision or whether we're going to do things, anything differently here that's specific to Ingham County, if that makes sense. Open up vaccine to everyone because that happens on April 5th. They're opening up Restrictions. What I guess I'm, I guess I'm a little confused with that question. Sure. Yeah, no, the question is 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 much more about uh, if it's going to be open to everyone. There are going to be vaccines uh, available to everyone. How we'll go about uh, you know administering? Will it be simply be to show up, people get in line, no questions asked, just get a vaccine, or will it, we still have appointments and registrations and things along those lines? I think with, with as long as demand is high, you will see appointments and registrations and things like that. Once we get to a point where demand goes down, then you probably will be able to show up somewhere and get vaccinated. You'll probably just be able to go to the pharmacy just like you can for many, many other vaccines and get a vaccine. So it's really a supply and demand thing. Right now, supply is low, demand is high. And so, um, you know, that is just not a way to do that. Now I've heard people that it's like, oh, we've got 200 vaccines today. You've seen this in Florida. And then people line up all night long trying to be the first two or 300. I don't consider that the most humane way to go about doing vaccinations when we know we have limited supply and when we know we need to target particularly vulnerable populations and follow some prioritization guidelines. It yeah. seems easier and more uh, a better way to treat people to have that when we send out a scheduling link to you. We don't just say, okay, we have 2,000 vaccines available this week. The first 2,000 people to, to jump on this link we just sent out get a vaccine. When you get a scheduling link from us, that means we have a vaccine for you. 
God, understand. You know, I'm going to ask all of our, our guests here to uh, to weigh in. You know, one of the things that we're seeing and the questions uh, with regards to the conversation is just uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there about the vaccines and uh, about uh, uh, side effects and uh, other things that that we haven't seen as a result of uh, sort of scientific evidence or any empirical uh, evidence. But I do want to ask all of you to uh, sort of reassure people, uh, reiterate your points about why you think it's not only important to get the vaccine, but why you believe the vaccine is safe and, uh, and, and that people should not be concerned about some of the misinformation that's out there. So uh, Linda, you're on the screen. Why don't we start with you and then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and go to the others. So um, we hear some stories about side effects. We hear some stories about adverse effects, and those are two different things. An adverse effect is something that happens to your body in reaction to the vaccine as you're getting it, usually within 15 minutes or so, which is why there's a 15 minute observation period. Um, those things can be, those are various allergic reactions. Um, and we always have paramedics on site, medic kits and all that sort of stuff on site. I would say to you that as far as adverse reactions and hearing about those with this particular vaccine and thinking that that's a concern, if we administered millions of doses of any vaccine all at one time across this country, we would probably see adverse events related to just about any vaccine. You have to realize, I mean, we don't administer millions of doses of MMR at any one time. We don't administer, you know, we just don't administer this many vaccines all at one time to anything. Those um, adverse events are very uh, rare. Um, they are very treatable when you have the proper medical care on site to treat them. And so that, that's part of it. The, the vaccines themselves were very well studied in large clinical trials to prove safety and efficacy. The studies are solid. They are good. Um, the side effects happen. I mean, if any of you have had your shingles vaccine, I know I didn't feel so good. I had a fever and I had chills and I had muscle aches for 24 to 36 hours. Um, so some vaccines will do that. Some people will have those kinds of reactions, some won't. I kind of like to tell people that when you get that side effect, you kind of should embrace it because what it does is tell you that your immune system is working. So a fever is not the disease itself. It's your body raising the temperature of your body because a virus or a bacteria doesn't like to live at that temperature. So your immune system raises the temperature of your body as part of its fight to kill what's going on in it. And so those side effects are very much just about your immune system doing exactly what it is supposed to do. That's, uh, those are great points. Thank you, Linda. Uh, 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 Dr. Beauchamp, uh, your thoughts on why this is so important and uh, why it's safe? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just first and foremost, um, there's been extensive studies that have tested the safety of the vaccines, and they're incredibly safe uh, with um, no significant um, uh, concerning effects compared to the very clear um, outcomes related to getting the coronavirus, including um, hospitalization and death. And so if you balance one off the other, one very safe uh, and one with a very clear demonstrated uh, morbidity and mortality, you know, I think that, that, that it's clear right, that the vaccine is, is safe and something I recommend to patients, family, friends, without, without hesitation. I think it's really important. And I really like the way uh, Linda characterized, you know, that you are going to react, which is a really good signal that your body is doing what it's supposed to, to generate antibodies and be ready to fight uh, the, the, the virus uh, if you actually catch it. And then maybe just to briefly touch on the question of anaphylaxis, which is, um, as was mentioned, it's very rare. And what, what has been seen is that um, if you do react to the Pfizer or the Moderna, you're not as likely, and they haven't said specifically to react to the Johnson & Johnson. So when it became available, you could sign up for that. But I think what I wanted to be clear, what you hear our panelists saying is you shouldn't go into it saying, well, I heard it's less with Johnson & Johnson, so please direct me to Johnson & Johnson. No, if there's a vaccine, as again, Dr. Docker said, and uh, Linda said, get that vaccine. But if you did have one reaction that was concerning with Moderna or Pfizer, it's not unreasonable 
to then sign up for Johnson Johnson when it becomes available. I understand. And uh, Dr. Tucker, I, I assume you would uh, concur? I concur with all that's been stated. Um, all the side effects are rare. Um, certainly, like Linda said, if you get these side effects, if you get a little bit, it, it's it's minimal. It's minimal typically. And there's someone there to watch healthcare professionals who are trained, who are there to watch out for you. And if there's something that happens that, you know, that's anaphylactic, of course, that can be reversed. And that is not something that is common. So certainly I, I wouldn't use that as my major fear for not getting the vaccine. Getting the a vaccine is way better than getting the disease. We certainly, we can't stress that enough. Um, and certainly, you know, we have to just make sure that we say, you know, as far as mistrust issues, we have to, you know, be sensitive to people who have mistrust issues and try to hear what um, they have to say as far as, you know, what their concerns are um, and try to alleviate those extra fears as much as possible. But whatever we can do, hopefully we've been able to help with that to get people to understand that this is a safe and effective vaccine, all of them. Absolutely. All, all very reassuring words. So I wanna thank our panelists for that. Uh, we, we can I, if I could, John, if, if I could add one thing that I think that we touched on, but for those that are younger in the younger age group who might not experience the same sequelae, right? 18 to 40, part of why to get, get this vaccine is to protect others, is to create a safe community. And the quicker we can get to more people vaccinated, uh, it also uh, decreases the likelihood to some extent that variants will become as prevalent. Um, so it also will help uh, for our younger folks to think about life getting back to normal and staying more normal um, is, benefits from their participation in trying to create an immunity across, across, you know, the communities. No, oh, great, great point, uh, Dr. Beauchamp. Uh, we have a lot of questions uh, where people are uh, uh, raising uh, individual concerns with regard to uh, potential uh, health issues. I just want to remind all of our guests that uh, our, our, our panelists here are extremely knowledgeable, but uh, they are not in a position to offer uh, specific uh, health advice. I would encourage uh, uh, anyone who needs specific health advice to, to contact your healthcare provider uh, and uh, to uh, follow that advice. Our panelists here are, are here to provide um, uh, facts and uh, counsel and, and, uh, and guidance, but not specific healthcare advice. Uh, you know, you, you all mentioned that uh, it's a good thing to see the body react to getting the vaccine. Uh, you know, we have an interesting question here where someone says, you know, you know I, I got the vaccine and I, I didn't feel anything, no reaction at all. Should I be concerned? Uh, I would assume not, uh, Norm, but uh, please, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I, I, I saw my two colleagues both nodding their heads that it's, it's not to worry and, and it, it's not indicative that you're not having your body react to it. It's only if you do get that reaction that you shouldn't worry. But it's a, it's a really good, thoughtful question because one might follow from the other, but no worry, no worry. Understand. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, as people get vaccinated, uh, you know, what's in the realm of possible with regard to behavior? Uh, obviously, people want to get back to normal. They want to start hanging out the, uh, together again and shaking hands and, and hugging. So do you all have thoughts on how people who are around other people who have been vaccinated, uh, how, how should they behave uh, until we get to a point where we've got herd immunity? I think you're seeing some good guidance out of the CDC on that. I think when people are fully vaccinated, um, we still don't recommend that, you know, your fully vaccinated people go all hang out together at some sort of a crowded restaurant or anything like that because they happen to be vaccinated. You're still in an environment with unvaccinated people. But as far as having a small gathering at your home with people who are also fully vaccinated, that is something the CDC has said is okay. Um, and quite honestly is, is okay. Um, as we proceed with vaccination, I think you'll see more of that. 
What I'd like to see is this country really embracing this 70 to 80% thing so that we don't end up in a situation like Israel is in right now, where they have about 60% of their vac population vaccinated and they, they probably will get more, but what they're doing is they're using a, like a green passport system. So that if you're vaccinated, you can go certain places or go to shows or travel or whatever, but if you're not vaccinated, you can't. And that raises significant concerns with me in terms of the haves and the have nots, equity, um, and how people are treated about what they can or can't do based on a vaccine. So I certainly would hope that we get to that point where enough of our population gets vaccinated, we create that herd immunity so that we don't have to go down any kind of a path where we have to talk about whether or not we can allow people who are vaccinated to fly, but not people who are unvaccinated. Um, there's something about that that at the, at the very core of me just feels wrong, um, but we have to get to that herd immunity. Understand. It's a very, uh, it's a great point. Uh, and, and Norma, back over to you. You know, I would assume that we need to get there partially because we still don't know enough about whether or not people who have been vaccinated can still transmit the uh, the disease. Is that correct? That is right. That's that is correct. And I think um, Linda nicely cites the CDC as as giving good guidance, and it makes sense the smaller groups, but to not go into large crowds without without thoughtfulness, I think is is very wise. Um, we're still asking folks to, to wear their masks uh, on campus um, and into the classroom. And although that may change in the fall, uh, we're going to have to see what we learn. And that's one of the really interesting things about COVID-19 is we're learning so much as we go. Um, but really looking to the CDC and our Ingham County uh, Health uh, <laughs> Director, uh, Linda Vale, is really a key, a key approach for us. Absolutely. And uh, I, I just want to say that uh, all of you have provided some really uh, fantastic information here today. Uh, Dr. Norm Beauchamp, Dr. Lakia Tucker, and of course, Ingham County Health Officer Linda Vale. This has been a great discussion. Um, I want to thank you for taking time to provide us with practical, factual information and insight into where we are with the COVID-19 vaccines. And to you, our employees, thank you for tuning in. I know we weren't able to get to all the questions today, but there were some really great questions and in the limited time we had here today, we weren't, we weren't able to answer every single one, but we will continue to work to address some of the more commonly asked questions uh, that we received today. Uh, on behalf of the entire uh, of our guests and everyone here at MSU, I want to thank you all for joining us. Have a great day. <laughs>